Hey, everybody. Hey, Dr. Tran. How's it going? Oh, we're okay. We're a little disappointed. We just found out that uh, Titan Rocket did not make it into our competitions here. Oh, oh man. Yeah, that's a bummer. Oh, man. Sorry to hear that. Yeah, they only took 150 teams out of almost 200. Uh -huh. So I kind of think it might have something to do with like logistics. Like they took less teams this year than they did last year. But last year's competition was virtual. So that may have played a part. Oh man, I'm but, sorry, uh, man. that doesn't hilarious. stop us though. We have uh, we still have other launches and other things that we can do, and we're looking forward to uh, you know finishing the project and still launching. We're we're not deterred. Okay, that's good. That's good. It's BS. I'm still mad. <laughs> is what it is. Oh, uh, Dr. Trent, I got a couple of questions about the midterm. I'm hoping that up. Uh, sure. Probably mm -hmm. answer them after the class. Sure. What's up? Oh, right now? Oh, okay. Uh, no, I was just working on the uh, the project over the weekend a bit. Just barely getting started, unfortunately. I've been really busy with other work coursework. Mm -hmm. um, I was working with the uh, turbine fin. Um, is that, like, not based on a wind turbine or? no it's, it's just a general kind of um turbine like device and so uh, uh, it's kind of in the shape it's kind of more in the shape of like like an like an aircraft engine honestly mm -hmm. yeah um, but it's really it's really small i think like yeah, if you, yeah. you actually look at the dimensions of it it's it's, it's a pretty small device yeah because so. yeah, at first i thought it was like that of a like a like those big old energy producing windmills Oh no! Yeah, it's definitely not that. It's uh, yeah, definitely it's... a much sm a much smaller blade. So, mm. um, and so you know, I think I think a lot of people are are, are putting in, um, you know, big big forces on it as if it were like a big wind turbine blade. But yeah, um, I think you have to tone it down just because it's it's it is a lot it's smaller. Very small. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I realized. Uh, okay, cool. Uh, that's one of the things that I had. Another one was uh, one of my situations was uh, someone happened to like throw a rope on it and was like trying to pull at it. So mm -hmm. what would be the best way for me to at least simulate that? Would I have to design and project like some type of a uh, spline line that's at least like on the tip and then pulling it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if, if you want to, if you want to specify where that rope is being pulled from, you, you can do that. Um, if you want to say that the rope is being pulled just from the, from the edge. And so you can just apply it on the, on the end edge of the turbine blade. So that doesn't require any projection. And so I would maybe start with that. And then if you want to okay. modify it a bit more, change the change the location, you can I do see. that by project by doing a projection. Okay. I see. <coughs> yeah. At first I was thinking of like using like projecting around where the fillet is, like one of the uh, top corner fillet uh sides, and just like applying a tensile force downward to it. Sure. Yeah, that sounds uh, that sounds good to me. Uh, professor, I had a couple questions about the midterm project too. Sure. Um, so I'm doing the bearing housing, mm -hmm. um, and I was able to find um, a axial load and a radial load um, for a bearing of that size. Mm -hmm. um, would I be able to use those loads in conjunction with uh, lengths from the bearing housing to find uh, moments for torque? Um, you can just apply the um, wait. So, so you've already applied the 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 axial modes and the and 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 the other modes. No, so I'm trying to uh, simulate uh, torque uh -huh. uh, by using the moment uh, uh, loading. Oh, I see. I see. Um, but um, I based off I based the uh, uh, the size of the load off the axial loads and the radial loads of the bearing mm -hmm. uh, by basically taking that load and using the either the diameter or a length from the bearing housing okay moment arm uh -huh. and then, uh, uh, using that for that calculation for the size of the moment okay would that work or yeah no, i i think that's reasonable okay. um yeah, because the because uh, the the moment arm or how big the the bearing housing is that's that's going to affect the torque uh, for sure. Okay. Yeah. And then I also had another question, real quick. Um, 
for my paper, um, because of the fact that it's limited by the bearing load, and I that's I don't think that's really much compared to the bearing housing. Mm -hmm. What I was doing for my analysis is kind of comparing the uh, two different materials and seeing how they stack up in terms of uh, um, yield strength and cost. Is that something I could do or? Uh, sorry, could, could you say that again? Sorry. Um, so because the, the bearing is more limited than the bearing housing in terms of strength, yeah. um, I was thinking of just comparing uh, two different materials based on yield strength, okay. um, a safety factor, and cost, and yep. determining based off those from my analysis um, on my paper. Is that okay, or should I come up with something else? Yeah, no, that's 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 valid. And so, um, you know, among the three situations that uh, that I'm asking to do, one of one of those situations could just be a change in the material um, okay. and see how that affects the results. So that that's perfectly valid. Yep. Okay, because the way I was doing it. Um, I think because I only came up with kind of two different load scenarios, mm -hmm. I was kind of um, I, I wanted to ask you if we only had to do two or if we had to do three. Yeah, so you have to do two mode scenarios and then your third your third scenario overall can just be a change of material um, for one of your one of your two loading scenarios. Okay. All right. Perfect. Thanks, Dr. Tran. Yep. Mm -hmm. Sorry, just to repeat. So we can literally have the same settings for one of them, and all we had to do was simply change the material. That's it. Correct. Yes. Oh, okay. Perfect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there's a question in the chat about the midterm exam, and so um, actually, let me check. Uh, let me check again when the homework is due. My my plan right now is to have it have the midterm exam a week after the homework is due. So let me check that date. Let's see. So right now the homework is due on the 17th. And so we'll have, or oh, are we getting into, are we getting into Thanksgiving on that, on that week then? When is Thanksgiving week? Okay. So right now we're in week 10, right? So this week 11, 12, 13, 14. Wait, week 10. 11. I think it's on the 25th. Oh. So Thanksgiving's on the 25th. Ooh. Okay. Right. It's like four weeks, four weeks away at okay. the moment. Yeah, right. Because because right now the originally the, the the plan was for the midterm exam to be next week, which is which is obviously not happening. That's that's not happening. Um, and so I want to give you some time after the after the homework is due. Um, but I did push the homework back because we did push the midterm project back. So, you know, I did want to give you a couple of weeks to work on the problem set. Um, and so let's say, let's say the midterm exam is going to be on the Thursday, right before Thanksgiving. And so it'll be on, it'll be on the Thursday of week 13. Yeah. And so if the homework, if the homework is due the day before that, then I'll, uh, maybe I'll push, maybe I'll push that homework due date up a little bit to be at the beginning of the week so I can give you the solution so you can study for the exam. But, uh, but let's have the midterm exam be on the Thursday right before, right before we go for Thanksgiving. Yep. We have to be in person for that one, right? Correct. Yes, you have to be in person for that. Oh, I uh, found uh, my problem that I have on my session. Oh, yeah? Uh -huh. um, so when you go in the, um, in the regular, or when you click on the mesh itself, um, one of the options was that besides the uh, I forgot what it was like something departure mm -hmm. or departure feature. I made that thing a little bit smaller, but mm -hmm. then the other one was like the uh, um, adaptive uh, mesh something. Mm -hmm. And I changed that from a no to yes, and also it opened up my problem back. Ah. So if there's any other students that had like a like continued problem with like the mesh, and maybe they just need it, maybe the they need to turn that on, maybe they'll help solve it. Okay, okay, great, great. Yeah, I'll keep that in mind if people have uh, issues. Um, so I have a question regarding I'm getting an error uh -huh. in Ansys, like not even like within the program. Uh -huh. So I kind of so when I downloaded Ansys initially, it kind of downloaded all the files on the like on the desktop. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when I tried moving them, it it like duplicated it. Mm -hmm. And then after like <laughs> trying to be hard to explain this. So, uh -huh. But um pretty much I'm getting like an error. So okay. I tried using the uninstaller so I could just like delete everything and then read the like re-download Ansys. Yeah. 
the uninstaller didn't work. So I tried deleting the files one by one. Okay. But when that happened, like there's a folder on there that won't go away. So when I like that, I keep trying to delete. Ah, it says the system, even, if, even when you try to delete as, as administrator. Yeah, even like I even put like the like Windows 10 like safe mode or whatever, which uh -huh. like allows you to like delete whatever programs you want. Uh -huh. Tried deleting it, wouldn't go away. When I re-download answers, remember like the problem that I was telling you, how like it kind of gets like all like weird and choppy. Which yeah, yeah. It's like illegible pretty much. Yeah, yeah. So whenever I try to fix that, it keeps trying to go to the original file location, which is um, where like the where like the one that's like everything's pretty much like deleted, which is like bare and bones. Uh -huh. And it's like I don't really know how to like. I don't okay. know how to get rid of it. Let's let's talk after class. Yeah, I think, that's I, was, yeah. I, I think that'll take that'll take a while to yeah. the kind of yeah, I've been I've been trying like for the past couple of days. I even like tried like, restoring my computer to like uh -huh. the previous like setting or whatever. Uh -huh. So like, the way. last time I and uh -huh. still nothing. I'm okay. getting errors. Okay. Yeah, let's uh let's let's I'll, let's let's meet up after class okay. and I'll I'll help you out. All right, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, it's uh, five thirty, so let's go ahead and get started today. All right, uh, good evening, everyone. How's everyone? Uh, how's everyone doing do this week? Good. Thumbs up. Thumbs up. Yeah. Busy week. I know it's the uh, week before the midterm project is due, so I'm, I know it's going to be a kind of a flurry of activity in the class. So, um, you know, no matter where you are in, in the project, you know, just uh, if you're having issues with anything, just you know, just let me know. Uh, I'm always happy to help with with those things. Okay. Um, and make use of make use of our Discord server too. And so I, I haven't checked it in a while, um, but you know, especially if you're running into um, you know errors within Ansys or or issues with Ansys, you know, you might get a faster response from your classmates by posting it on the Discord um, than if you than if you contact me. I mean, I, I'll I'll try to get I always try to get back to you as fast as I can, um, but just lately the last couple of weeks have been just really busy for me, and so you know I'm not I'm not responding as, as quickly as I would like to. Um, and so if you have an issue that you that you know maybe someone else in the class has had you know please please use the discord server um and that way if other people have the same issue they can find it on the discord server as well okay um and so it's like a collect it's kind of like a collective um debugging debugging space for, for everyone to use okay and so the plan for today is uh, we're going to continue our lecture notes on uh, on trust on trust equations okay and so i have one more big example to do um and a couple of other concepts that i want to go over and so I'm hoping to finish that for sure today, and then we should be able to start um, our next set of lecture notes on beam equations. Okay. All right. So before I start, uh, some logistics. And so there was some discussion before the class about the midterm exam, right? And so that's different from the midterm project. And so remember, midterm project is due next uh, next Tuesday, right? And so that's uh, Tuesday. Um, I don't even know the date. Next Tuesday, November second, by 11:59 p.m. Okay. Um, and then in addition to the midterm project, we also have a midterm exam, okay? Right, so right now, so I, I, have to, I have to change this, but right now on the, on the course website, the midterm, it says the midterm exam is gonna be next week. Um, so that's, that's obviously not gonna happen. That's, that's, it's not gonna be next week. Um, and so right now the midterm exam is gonna be planned for Thursday, the Thursday right before we leave for um, um, Thanksgiving. Okay, so it's Thursday, November eighteenth. Okay, and this exam is going to be is going to take place in person, and so that's that's going to be the only day that I ask you guys that, that I ask everyone to come in person, you know, to take the exam. All right. So plan. So plan on being in person on on that day. Okay. All right, question. So is it open notes? So it will not be open notes. And so, um, you know, um, you, I, I, it, you can't use your notes, but I will allow you to use a one, um, one eight and a half by 11 cheat sheet. Okay. 
and you can use both sides of the uh, of the sheet. Okay. And in terms of the topics, you know, the topics for the uh, for the midterm exam is basically all the direct stiffness stuff um, that we've been covering. Um, no, it's not. It's so the uh, so the midterm exam is going to be um, problem solving, and so it's basically everything that we've been covering with direct stiffness. Okay. Um, and so you know these these problems are are not uh, they're not small problems, and so you know they they do take quite a bit of time, and so your your main practice for for the midterm exam is going to be the problem set that I posted um, last week. Okay, and so it's the it's the only problem set that you know that we're going to do in this class. Everything else is ANSYS, you know. But this is but this is kind of when we do kind of the the, the pen and paper calculations. Okay. Okay. Um, and so, you know, definitely look at problem set one and, and make sure that you can do all those problems to, um, you know, um, to give you practice for the exam. Okay. Uh, so remember what I said last week, you know, problem set one is, is, is quite a doozy. And so it, it does, it does take quite a bit of time. And so uh, make sure that you're, you're starting it um, early. Okay. All right. Question. So the cheat sheet is type or handwritten. So it's either one. And so you can, um, you can type it or you can handwrite it, you know, whichever, uh, whichever you want. So the only thing I ask is that uh, um, is that you you be able to read your cheat sheet with just your eyes, so no magnifying glasses or no um, you know I've, I've seen people do like uh, they print the cheat sheet on one on one side it's it's red, but on the same side they do blue, but kind of overlap, and so you can wear kind of like red blue glasses to see. So none none of that either. So you know you have to be able to read the cheat sheet with just your just your regular eyes. It will be a uh, pen and paper. And so, um, you know, I'll give, I'll provide you the paper for the exam um, and you can bring a calculator for it as well. Yeah, time limit, yes. And so it'll it'll take place within the confines of the, uh, of the lecture. And so it'll be a 75 minute exam. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what is the benefit of the red and blue thing? Like with the, the eyeglasses? I mean, like, how does it help? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's basically so that you can, um, you can overlap, you know, you can, you can, I, I, I don't actually know if this is how it works, but the way, the way I imagine is that you, you type up one side uh, with red ink and then, you, and then you print over that in blue ink. Um, but I think there's kind of a special way that you do that. And so if you wear like red glasses, only the red font will show up. If you wear blue glasses, the blue font will show up. So it's a way to kind of basically double up, um, double oh. up the amount of space that you have on. on wow, yeah. mm -hmm. that's cool. Yeah, uh, at, least, at least that's how I think it works, but you know, I'm not sure. sure, sure. All right, question, MATLAB for the exam. There will be no MATLAB, and so it'll be all just pen and paper calculations, but you also won't have to do any solving on the exam. And so the way I imagine this, the exam happening is that, you know, I want you to be able to write out the element stiffness matrices. I want you to be able to assemble the global system, apply the boundary conditions, and then from there you can stop. And so there's, uh, you know, there's no need to solve. And so I'm gonna be looking at your matrices to make sure that they're set up, they're set up properly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you're not gonna need it. Um, and so one one small point with this too is this is just to, just to make sure that um, um, you know because after after everyone turns in problem set one I'm going to post the solutions to it just so that you can have them to study just so that you can have um, some um, some some time with that you know I'm going to push up the, the due date for problem set one just just by a day because I think right now it's due on November 17th at 11:59 p.m. Um, and so I'm going to push this up a day to be due on November 16th. Um, just so that you know, I can post the the answers. Then you have like a, you know a full day to look at them to uh, you know for the uh, to study for the exam. Yeah. Our question. So no answer software, correct? So you you're uh, there's gonna be no software at all for, for the exam. Mm -hmm. um, any calculator? Yeah, any calculator. Any calculator is fine. You you shouldn't need it because it's all gonna be just uh, you know writing out matrices. Um, but you know if you if you want to bring it, then that's that's fine too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, um, but that's but that's later. And so you know, let's let's you know, I, I want to talk about it today just because you know we have uh, you know it, it kind of came up today. But you know, I want everyone just to focus on the midterm project for now, and then you know after next week, then we'll start you know preparing for the exam. And so you know, just and so I, I do this for all my exams. But you know, I'll you know once the date gets a little bit closer, 
you know, probably sometime next week, I'll provide you a study guide that which you can use to, uh, you know, it, it'll basically be a list of topics that you're going to be responsible for knowing for the exam. Um, and I'll also do a review video. And so uh, what I do for what I usually do for my midterm exams is that I on a, usually on a Friday, um, I'll take I'll put out a poll so that um, you guys can vote on what topics you you feel most uncomfortable with. And then I'll make a, a pre recorded YouTube video uh, where I review that topic so that you can have that to help you with the exam as well. And so I'll probably post that on the Friday, the Friday before the exam week. And so you have that weekend and, you know, and the week leading up to that to, to use the video to help you study. Yes. Um, you know, but we'll, but we'll, we'll talk about this a lot more after the midterm project is due. So, you know, first thing, first things first, midterm projects due a week from now. So, you know, make sure, make sure that's done. And then, you know, we'll worry about the exam after that. Okay. All right. Um, any questions on anything before we, uh, we get started today? Okay. All right, and so uh, let's go ahead and resume back to our lecture notes on uh, on truss equations. All right, so we're about we're about I would say a little bit over midway through our our, our whole set of lecture notes on direct stiffness. Okay, and so we've done springs up to this point. You know, we're we're kind of in the middle of trusses. And then after this, the last um, element type that we'll learn with direct stiffness is beams, okay? And so just to kind of summarize where we were last week, you know, what we, the primary thing that we learned last week was how to do truss, truss and spring problems in 2D. And what we saw from, uh, from that analysis was that, you know, by going to the second dimension, we have a lot of things that we need to consider, right? Primarily, primarily just due to the fact that we can have, we can have display, displacements and deformations in the X and Y direction, you know, that, that kind of increases the complexity of our calculations, you know, by a factor of, of you know, two square actually, okay? And so as a result, you know, our element stiffness matrix, which previously was only two by two, now our element stiffness matrix was four by four. All right, and so I, I think the last thing that we did last Thursday was we did an example problem with this, so to see how it all kind of fits together in 2D. And so today what I want to do is I, I primarily want to do one more example that shows you, um, that you know, kind of shows the whole thing in action. Um, but I also want to talk about a few other extra topics that we can do now that we are kind of um, extended to the 2D. Okay. The, first, the first of these topics is um, how to actually compute stresses or structural stresses within a truss element. All right, so stress is, is, is something that you know, we're all very familiar with, and so it, it's become a big part of our ANSYS activities. Um, and so even though we're, we're doing these um, direct stiffness problems with a different you know, methodology, you know, we can still compute stresses. It's just the way that we're doing it is, is a little bit different, okay? All right, and so just to kind of remind ourselves, the, um, you know, the, way, um, the way stresses are computed in a truss element is you take, um, you know, the, uh, you divide the, um, the forces in the, um, in the truss divided by the cross-sectional area. Okay. Another way that we can express the force is the fact that, you know, for our truss elements, right? 
And so let me just kind of just do a 1D case just to be simple here, okay? And our trusses, you know, we're able to compute what are the forces being applied at the, at the nodes, right? And so we have F1 and F2, okay? And in order for this um, truss to be in equilibrium, then F1 has to equal to F2, okay? And so another way that we can compute the stress is if we take, you know, either F1 or F2, okay? I'll just say F2 and we divide by A. Um, and so if we know F2, you know, at least F2 within the local coordinates of the, of the element, then we can compute the stresses that the, uh, that the truss element is overthrowing, okay? And so the way that we actually compute this is that, you know, this F2, you know, we, we usually are gonna compute this based on the deformation solution. Okay. All right, and so I'll show you the equations for that on the next page. But basically, you know, the, the way that we can compute stresses is we're gonna take our deformation solution. And so we're gonna take, you know, our solution for, you know, deformation X, deformation Y at each of the nodes of our truss. And then we're going to um, just multiply it by a certain value. And then that's gonna give us our stresses. Okay. All right, any questions on, uh, any questions on this? Okay. All right. And so normally when we solve these direct stiffness problems, what we obtain are um, the deformations at the, at the nodes. And we usually gave this the symbol u hat, right? right? But u hat here, this is related to also the nodal forces, you know, by the following equation, right? And so, you know, normally we have this element stiffness system, right? And I'm doing everything in, in the local coordinates right now, okay? And so we're not in the global coordinates yet. And so if we wanted to just say that, you know, the only thing we need here is just F2, right? And so if we take an equation for F2, okay, what we can say is that this is equal to AE divided by L times the vector minus one, one times U1 hat, U2 hat. What we can do from here is that we can we can expand this, right? Because right now this is all in the local coordinates. And so, you know, ideally we'd want this in terms of the stationary coordinates, okay? Okay. And so the first thing we're gonna do is I'm, I'm gonna expand this out. And so we have F2 hat is equal to AE over L times minus one, zero, one, zero, okay, times U1 X hat, mm. move this away, okay. This could be multiplied by U1 X hat, U1 Y hat, U1, or U2 X hat, U2 Y hat, okay. All right, so all I did was I, I added kind of placeholders for um, displacements in the y direction in the local coordinates. 
um, which, you know, because we are in the local coordinates, those U1 Y hat and U2 Y hats are gonna be zero, okay? But we need them because um, from here, what we can do is that we can take this vector right here and convert this into the stationary coordinates using our transformation matrix. Right, and so you're going to see me, um, you know, basically replace this with t times u, um, u without the hat, and then that's going to give us our expression for the uh, um, for the stress. Okay. All right. Any questions on uh, any questions on this so far? Yeah. What is that last part say? It's a uh, stationary. Oh. Yeah. So we want to, because basically, you know, because all of these um, deformation components are in the local coordinates, we want to transform it into the stationary ones. And so we're going to apply our transformation matrix to make it so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And so I'm going to go ahead and sub make a substitution there. Okay. And so we have F2 hat is equal to AE over L. I'll give myself more room this time. Minus one zero one zero, okay. Times our transformation matrix, times u one x u one y u two x u two y, okay. And so now you know these um, these deformations here are in the stationary coordinates because they don't have a hat anymore, okay. Because I pre multiplied by this transformation here, okay. And then all we have to do from here is just to um, basically multiply that transformation matrix through this vector right here, okay? And then we're gonna divide both sides by A in order to get us the stress, right? And so our final equation for the stress is, we're gonna have E divided by L times minus cosine, minus sine, cosine, sine, okay, times our U vector, okay? Where U vector here is our vector of station of stationary nodal displacements um, you know that we obtained from the finite element solution okay. yeah would uh, f2 still have the hat it would yes would. yeah so f so we don't we don't want to transform f2 because the because the stress here you know we're going to compute it based off the forces that are you know within um within in line with the element and so, you know, if our element is like this, right, what we actually want is we actually want a, a force component in that direction. And so when we divide that by the, um, divide that by the area, then we get the actual structural stress within this, within this bar. And so we only transform one side of the equation, but the other side we kept, we kept the same. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay, okay. Yep. yep. Were the placeholders zero because we got rid of that other row? Uh, so the so the placeholders were zero because in the in the local coordinates, remember we don't have any deformation in this direction, right? And so because the truss element is assumed to only displace, you know, within the um, you know in the within in line with the element, then you know all the perpendicular component deformation is going to be zero. And so you know we place zeros there to basically um, you know make sure that is. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Mm -hmm. Could you explain that again as to why the trusses don't have any y displacement? Yeah, it's uh, it's basically it's it's basically an assumption that we're making on on the deformations. Yeah. So next, so the next type of element that we'll go over are beams, and so those ones will will have deformations and perpendicular to the element. Yeah. yeah. But for trusses, we we basically just assume that they're only going in compression or tension. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. And so one uh, one more. Um, you know, one more piece of information before we jump into another example um, is with a is with respect to the um, to the constraints that we can apply. Okay. In particular, um, we're going to start to consider situations with rower supports. Okay. All right. Oh yeah, yeah. 
-hmm. Yeah. So the so the idea with roller supports. So so now that we're in two D, um, you know we have we have basically two 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 um two um components of deformation in every node, right? Okay. And so normally, you know, what we can have is uh, we can have a, um, you know, we can have a pin support. And so a pin support looks something like this. And so it's going to have a pin at the top. Okay. And um, this is going to knock out basically two components of the of the deformation. Okay, and so let's say that we have a truss element um, attached here. Then at this node right here, both UX and UY are gonna be equal to zero, okay? And so that's what a pin support will do. So a pin will you know, knock out both, um, it'll constrain both components of the deformation, okay? A rower support on the other hand, will only knock out one component of the, uh, of the deformation. Okay. And so if we have a roller support like this, okay. And in recent years, you know, I, I've been, you know, I've been kind of favoring drawing the roller supports kind of something like, like this, where, you know, the roll, the wheels are actually within a track. And so, you know, the, the roller support is free to move in, in these directions, parallel to the, to the ground, uh, but it can't move perpendicular to the ground um, at all. Okay. But I think you know the classical the classical way to draw roller support is really just like a roller skate on top of on top of the ground. Um, but I think when you draw in a track like this, it kind of illustrates the fact that it can't you know it can't go up. Okay? And so in this case, if this is the x direction and this is the y direction, okay, the only deformation component that this is going to constrain is just the y component. Okay, and so this is going to say that u y is equal to zero, but u x here is still free. And so we can still solve for an x displacement here, uh, but the y displacement is going to be is going to be zero. All right. And so in the next example, you know, we're going to basically pull both of these, um, you know, pull both of these ideas together. And so, you know, the next example is going to have a roller support, and it's also, um, and afterwards, we're also going to, going to compute the stresses uh, within the truss elements. Okay. All right. Any questions on uh, any questions on this? Okay. All right. So let's do, let's do another example. Um, you know, this is going to be another 2D example. So I think this is a good one, um, you know, just to, just to get some additional practice because, you know, these problems, these problems do take a while. And so they're not short problems. And so I think the more, the more examples, the more practice that we do, I think the, the better it's, it's going to be. Okay. All right. All right, so let's consider a situation where we have um, two, um, two bar elements. Okay. And so let's say that we have a pin support up here. Okay. And then on the bottom here, let's say that we have a rower support. Okay. 
And then our two um, truss elements are going to be connected just like this. Okay. So we'll have one truss element like that, and another truss element just like that. Okay. So we'll call this element A. We'll call this element B. Okay. Let's say that this length right here is going to be five feet, where this length right here is going to be ten feet. Okay. And both elements are going to have the same um, properties. And so let's say that the Young's modulus here is going to be 30 times 10 to the 6 PSI. Okay. And the cross-sectional area is going to be one inch squared. Okay. And the angle here that these two make with each other is 30 degrees. Okay. And we're going to assume that element B here is completely horizontal. And so before I kind of move forward, let me go ahead and label the nodes. And so node number one will be the one that's kind of overhanging on the right-hand side, okay? Node number two will be the one up top on the pin support. And then node number three will be the one on the bottom on the roller, okay? And in terms of loads, we're going to apply a downward 25,000 pound load on node number one, okay? All right. And so for this problem, we're going to write out the element stiffness matrices. Um, we're going to assemble the global system. Once the global system is, is assembled, we can apply boundary conditions. Um, then we're going to solve. Okay. Then after we solve for the solution, we're going to compute um, compute the stresses in each element. Okay. And so a lot to do with this problem, but I think you know it's a good one because we're going to run we're going to run through the whole process you know from from start to finish. Okay. All right. Any questions on on this one here before we before we start to solve? Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and and uh, start. Um, you know, let's start let's start with the element stiffness matrices as, as we always do. Okay. All right. And so let's start with element A. And so element A is the one that's slanted upwards like this. We know the length of the element. The length of the element is 60 is 10 feet, um, which you know we're going to put in inches. And so this is going to be 120 inches. Okay. Um, and then we're just going to plug into our equation for the um, element stiffness matrix. Okay. But we have to be careful here because the because uh, the key parameter, you know, when you're working with two D elements, the key parameter here is the angle at which you're going to plug in for the uh, for the matrix. Okay. And so it's really tempting. It's really tempting to look at the figure and say that this angle should be thirty degrees, right? Uh, but the fact that I'm kind of you know saying it like that makes it seem like it's it's not going to be thirty degrees, and 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 it's not. Okay. And so I'll, I'm going to show you guys a trick that I, I use to make sure that to kind of always make sure that my angles are consistent um, and correct when I when I'm plugging into this. Okay. And so whenever you whenever you have an element um, in the direct stiffness method like this, you know there's always going to be you know there's always going to be two nodes in your element, right? And so there's going to be one node 
which has a lower number and another node that has a higher number, okay? All right, so the trick is to basically draw a line from the lower number node to the higher number node. And so if we draw the element, you know, like this, okay, where, you know, element one or node one is gonna be on the bottom here and node two is on the top, okay. If we draw a line between nodes one and two, you know, we end up with a line like that, okay? Except it should be more straight because I get draw, okay? Now what you're supposed to do is to draw the positive x-axis from the lower number node, okay? Okay. And so in this case, the lower number node is node one. And so I'm gonna draw the X axis like this. Okay. All right. And so the trick here is that, um, you know, starting from the positive X axis, the angle that you're gonna put into the element stiffness matrix is the amount of rotation that you need to perform in order to go from the positive x-axis to whatever your element configuration is. And so, um, you know, we're going to start from the x-axis here, and then we're going to quantify how much we're going to rotate in order to get to that configuration, okay? And so starting here, you can see that we're going to rotate this much, just like that, okay? And the angle that this sweeps out is actually 150 degrees, right? And so this is the angle that we're going to plug into our matrix, right? And so I know it's 150 degrees because from the, from the image, right, we know that this angle right here is 30 degrees, right? And to make a complete, you know, um, a complete kind of half turn um, to go from the positive X axis down to the other side is 180 degrees. And so I took 180 degrees minus 30 and I end up with 150 degrees, okay? And so this is gonna be our theta value. And so when you're when you're choosing angles for your 2D trust problems, you have to be really careful about what you choose for the angle because it uh, it makes a big difference. Yeah. All right, question. So how were the node numbers chosen? Um, se uh, se semi randomly, uh, but the uh, so for the for the for the problems that I, I give you, I, I'll always have the node node numbers assigned for you, and so that's that's something that you never have to do yourself. But but if you're asking the way that I chose them, um, semi semi randomly. All right, and so, um, you know, and so we're gonna plug in theta is equal to 150 degrees into our element stiffness matrix, and then that's gonna give us our, our values, okay. Um, all right, any questions on, uh, any questions on this? Okay, all right, so let's go ahead and plug in that, that value for theta. Okay. And so if we do that, if we have theta is equal to 150, then we say that cosine of that angle is gonna be minus root three over two and sine of the angle, sine is gonna be a positive one half. 
And so plugging those in, we get Ka is equal to 2.5 times 10 to the fifth, right? And so this value right here comes from Ae over L. Okay. And so that's gonna be multiplied by this four by four matrix, which is gonna be three fourths minus root three over four, minus three over four, root three over four, okay. Minus root three over four, one fourth, root three over four, minus one fourth, okay. Minus three fourths, root three over four, three over four, minus root three over four, root three over four, minus one fourth, minus root three over four, and one fourth, okay? And this is gonna be acting on nodes one and two. So we have U1X, U1Y, U2X, U2Y, okay? And so this is the element stiffness matrix for, um, for element A, okay? All right. Okay. So element A had an angle of 150 degrees. Now let's look at element B. And so element B looks like this. And so it's a horizontal element. On the right-hand side, we have node one. And on the right-hand side, we have node three, okay? And so with those in mind, you know, what, what is our angle here, right? right? And so let's do the same trick that we did for, um, for the last one, right? And so if we draw a positive x-axis this way, right? And so in order to rotate the, uh, um, in order to rotate the positive x-axis to be within the orientation of this element, we can see that we have to rotate 180 degrees, okay? And the main reason is because, you know, um, if we draw an arrow going from node one to node three, you know, that's gonna be pointing to the left. And so we have to rotate 180 degrees to get there. Right? And so cosine of 180 is of course gonna be minus one and sine of 180 is actually gonna be zero. So actually this simplifies our, um, you know, our calculations quite a bit, okay? Okay, whenever you get a zero for one of the sines or cosines, it, it, it makes it so that your life is a lot easier. Okay. And so we have KB is equal to five times 10 to the fifth. Okay. We have one, zero, minus one, zero. Okay. Zero, 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 zero. Minus one, zero, one, zero. And then zero, 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 zero. Right. And so the deformation um, degrees of freedom are going to be U1X, U1Y, and uh, U3X and U3Y. Okay. Right. And so now that we have um, all of these um, elements right here, uh, we are ready to assemble this into the global linear system and then apply, apply boundary conditions. Okay. All, right. All right, any questions on, uh, any questions on this stuff? Okay. All right, and so let's go ahead yeah, and- Sorry, uh, oh, sorry, Professor, real quick, the five times 10 to the negative, or some five times 10 to the fifth. Yeah. What? How how are we uh, getting those? Oh, that was the AE over L. Right. Yeah. And so that's the uh, so you take the area, you multiply it by the um, Young's modulus, and you divide by the length. <laughs> by the length. I think the okay, unit, yeah. 
Yeah, I think the units for this is going to be pounds per inch. All right, so let's go ahead and assemble this into the into the global linear system. Okay. All right. All right, so for assembly, we have 10 to the fifth out here in front. Okay. And our global linear system here is going to have is going to be a six by six, right? Because we have three nodes in total, and each of those three nodes is going to have two degrees of freedom. Okay. And so that makes for six, uh, six degrees of freedom overall. Okay. All right. And so let's go ahead and box out uh, where each of the elements are going to are going to reside. Okay. Okay. So first we have element A, and so element A is going to um, take up um, nodes one and two. Okay. And so that's going to be all of these guys right here. Okay. Whereas element B, element B is acting on nodes one and three. Okay. And so we're going to highlight all of the one and three rows and columns in the matrix. Okay. okay so that's that area, this area, this area. and this area. So first thing we can uh, we can do immediately is uh, we can assign zeros at the places that are not boxed, right? And so we have kind of two regions here that aren't boxed. And so we can just go ahead and place zeros um, all the way through all the way through there, okay? And then we from here we can go ahead and, and fill in, um, you know everything else. Okay, um, so it is it is going to get a little bit messy, um, and so you just have to bear with me. Okay, um, and so starting from the top left, you know we add together we add together contributions from element B and element A into that top left region, and so what we get is six point eight seven five. Okay, notice that I have a ten to the fifth out here sitting out in front. Um, you know, just to kind of make our, our life a little bit easier. Okay. Right. And there we have a minus 1.08. Then we have a, we have a minus 1.875. Then we have 1.08. We have minus five and we have zero. Okay. Then starting in the second row, we have a minus 1.08. 0 0.625, 1 1.08 minus um, 0 0.625. Okay. And we have two more zeros. Okay. We have one is minus 1.875, 1 1.08, 1 1.0, 1 1.875. Okay. Uh, then we have the rest of the zeros for that uh, for that row. Okay. All right, almost done. We just have one more row here. And so this is one point zero eight. Here's zero point six two five minus one point zero eight. Zero point six two five. Okay. And the last of this is really easy. So we have a minus five. Zero zero zero, 
Okay, positive five, zero, zero, zero. Yeah. Is that 6.875? Yeah. Yeah, it's 6.875. All right. <clears throat> and so, you know, a little bit tedious, but still, uh, you know, um, but not too bad, um, at least not compared to some of the homework problems. That's, that's for sure. Right. Okay. And so a couple of things here. And so, you know, the next thing, the next step, you know, obviously we, we're going to apply boundary conditions on this. And so we're going to be modifying the system, you know, pretty significantly. Um, but before we do that, you know, I, I want to draw your attention to the last row in this matrix and the last column. Okay. And so if you notice that the entire last row and the entire last column are all zeros, right? And so what this tells us is that U3Y, right? Because these, because uh, that row and that column corresponds to U3Y in particular, okay? This tells us that U3Y is not going to be an active participant in this, um, in this structure. In other words, what this is telling us is that, you know, U3Y has basically no way of interacting with all the other deformation components, and it has no way to interact with any loads too, okay? And so what this tells us is that U3Y in the structure has to be zero. Okay? And so we can go ahead and just eliminate this entire row and eliminate this entire column from our matrix, because, you know, we're, uh, it's just, it's just going to mess up our calculations, our calculations later. Okay. All right. <clears throat> and so with that out of the way, um, let's go ahead and apply our boundary conditions, our boundary conditions now. Okay. All right. And so we had two, we had two constraints here. And so we had a constraint on node two. And so remember node two was pinned. Right. If we go back to our, if we go back to our uh, diagram for the uh, um, for our structure, so long ago, we can see that node two here is is pinned, right? And so this tells us that u u two x and u two y are going to be zero. Okay. So let's go ahead and apply that constraint onto our onto our matrix here, okay? And so if u two x is going to be zero, then this is going to take place on this row right here, okay? And so we're going to eliminate the row. And so all the hard work that we did in plugging in those numbers, okay? We're gonna put zeros on every entry, except for the diagonal entry, right? And so for the, di di for the diagonal entry, we're gonna put one right there, okay? And then we're going to do the exact same thing, exact same thing uh, for U two Y. Okay. And so we're going to eliminate the whole row, put zeros in every entry in that row, except for the diagonal entry, which we're going to put. We're going to put one. Okay. All And so the other constraint that we had on this uh, on this situation was a rower support on node number three. Okay, and so that tells us that u three x is going to be equal to zero. And so if we go to the matrix and we go to the row for u three x, we're going to circle the whole thing, and we're going to change all the entries to zeros, except for the diagonal one, which we're going to put make as one. Right. 
And so now we're left with the matrix where, you know, we have two rows that are active. And so we have um, the U1X and the U1Y rows. Those are still fine there, okay? But we've eliminated basically all the other rows in the matrix from the, from the problem. And so the last thing that we have to apply before we hit solve is we have to apply our load, okay? And so our load in this case is a, um, a force of 25,000 pounds, and that's acting in the negative Y direction, and it's acting on node one. And so, you know, I don't have any room for it here, but the place that we're gonna put it is on the row for, um, you know, U1, Y, and we're gonna have it be, go be going down uh, with a force of um, minus 25,000, okay? All right. And so with all those changes to the linear system, you know, we're now ready to, you know, plug this into MATLAB and actually get a solution from this, okay? All right. Any questions on this before we, um, before we go ahead and, and solve this? Why is it that the uh, the U two X U two Y on the right would put the zero, but not the actual vertical? Um, but not the vertical. You mean the row? The row is made to zero, but mm -hmm. the columns are. Uh, ah, and so the the reason for that is that each row here, remember, represents a, an equation in the uh, um, in the system, and so each row is kind of like you know we have. This matrix is representing six equations and six unknowns. And so by replacing the row, you know, we're, we're, we're basically just replacing one of our equations with that, with that constraint. Okay. And so if we did a column, it would, it would kind of affect all six equations at the same time. But we only wanted to do just one, one equation. Yeah, question. Um, just to be sure, uh, so we're saying that there's no deformation in the, on the three and the Y groups. Yeah. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's, this doesn't necessarily mean that it's moving around. It's uh, in this case, it's not moving around at all. And so we're we're basically saying that um, you know because of the structure of the of the global stiffness matrix here, there's no way for any load to be transmitted to to um, the y direction of node three, um, just because just because that element is kind of perfectly horizontal. And remember, you know, um, deformations in a truss are just going to be tension and compression. And so there's basically no way for it to displace in that y direction, and that and that shows in this element stiffness vectors because it has all zeros on the x and the y, or on the on the row and the column. That's kind of like another pin. Yes. Yeah. And so even even though we put a row there, it's it's basically another pin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there a question over over here too? Okay. All right. So um, now that we we've, we've we've got all these numbers, we can go ahead and plug those into MATLAB. Okay. or whatever your favorite software is for solving linear systems, okay? And so you do that, what we get is U1X is equal to minus 0 0.0862 inches, okay? U1Y is gonna be equal to minus 0 0.549 inches, okay? U2X and U2Y are both going to be zero inches because they're at the pin support. Okay. 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 <clears throat> and then uh, U3X and U3Y are also going to be zero due to these supports. Yeah. Yeah, it's a uh, um, 0, 0 0.549. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so now that we have the deformation solution at, uh, each, at each of the nodes, we are now ready to compute the stresses, right? Because uh, remember, you know, at the beginning of class today, we said that once we have the deformations, we can use those deformation solutions in the stationary coordinates to compute 
what the stresses are. Okay. All right, so let's start with element A. Right? So let me write out the formula. And so the formula for the stresses is we're going to take the Young's modulus divided by the length of the element. And so we're going to multiply that by uh, minus cosine, minus sine, times cosine, and sine. Okay. And we're going to multiply this by a vector of the nodal displacements for the element. And so I think this is the only tricky part about using this equation is that this vector here has to be comprised of the deformations of that particular element. Okay. Okay. And so I have, you know, U1X, U1Y, U2x, U2y here as, as basically like placeholders. Um, but in reality, you know, you're going to replace this with, you know, what are the actual nodal displacements for this, uh, for this element, okay? And so we have two elements here. And so we have two elements where we can compute, uh, where we can compute stresses, okay? And so I'll start with element A um, and fill in the values for that. And then we'll do the same thing for element, element B. Okay. All right, any questions on, uh, on this before we, we start plugging in? All right, so let's go ahead and, and start plugging in. So remember element A. Okay. So element A, the uh, the angle for that one is 150 degrees. Okay. And the nodes that it's connected to are gonna be nodes one and two. Okay. And so sigma A, which is gonna be the stress in element A is equal to E divided by L you know, which we, which we know for this element, okay? Then we have minus cosine, which is uh, root three over two, minus sine, which is minus one half. We have cosine, which is minus root three over two, and then sine, which is one half, okay? And then we plug in, you know, each of the nodal displacements or nodal deformations uh, for that element. Okay, and so we're going to plug this straight in from our finite element solution. So u one x is equal to minus zero point zero eight six two inches. Okay, u one y here is minus zero point five four nine. Okay, and then u two x and u two y is going to be zero. Okay. And so if we perform this multiplication, you know, we basically just have a dot product between these two vectors because it's the multiplication of a row vector and a column vector, okay? And so we have E over L times um, root three over two times minus 0 0.0862 inches, okay? Minus, minus one half, times minus 0 0.549 inches, okay? Plus zero plus zero, because you know we have zeros here, okay? And so you plug, you plug everything in, you plug in the Young's modulus, you plug in the length. What you get is a stress value of 49,962 PSI. Um, professor, yeah, is that equation just something that we'll always know to use, or will we have to derive it like you did every time? You you can just use that equation. So I so I derived it just so that you know where it's coming from. Um, but if I ask you to compute stresses in a truss element, you can you can just use that equation. Yeah, yeah. I I, I almost never ask you to derive anything on on a homework or an exam. I I do you know even even in the lectures you know I I try to be a little bit light on my derivations. Um, but I would never ask you to derive something, uh, you know, um, on a homework or something like that. So, you know, any equation that I give you in the lecture, you can just you can just use it right away. I was just mostly wasn't sure if it would change depending on the situation. 
Yeah, so the so it's it's going to change depending on the angle, right? And so you know we have the cosine and sines of the angles built in here, um, and so you know depending on the orientation of the element, you know it's going to affect what's in here. Yeah, and of course you know the the deformations are going to change element to element too, you know depending on you know depending on the nature of your um, of your finite element solution. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Any other questions on on this? Okay, so let's do the same thing for element B, and then we'll call it a wrap for trust for trust equations. Okay, for element B, remember our angle for this one was one eighty. Okay, and so we have sigma B. This is going to be equal to e over l okay. times the row vector. We have a minus cosine, so minus cosine is going to be one. Um, minus sine is going to be zero. Cosine is going to be minus one, and sine here is going to be zero. Okay. And remember, element B. Well, you know, for this problem, it doesn't really make a difference. But you know, for element B, we're connected to nodes one and three. And so the entries that you're going to put into this um, vector here are going to be u1x, u1y, okay? u3x, u3y, okay? But for this one, you know, it doesn't really matter because they're, they're all zero, but, you know, make sure you're always kind of keeping that in mind. Okay. All right, and so we plug in all of our deformation values, um, you know, into the into the vector there, and we perform the uh, which is essentially a dot product, um, just like we did before, and what we get is a minus forty three thousand three hundred psi. And if you notice here, you know, our stress is negative, right? Okay. And so a negative stress is, is basically telling us that our element is in compression, right? Which makes sense, right? Because, uh, you know, the fact that U1X here is um, a minus 0 0.0862, that means that node one is, is being displaced to the left, right? And so if we draw our element B like this, right? And where this is out node one, right? And so if this is being um, you know, displaced in that direction, that means that element B is being compressed. It's being squished you know, by the fact that it's one of its ends being put, punched in you know, by, the, by the other, okay? Whereas element A, you know, element A had a positive stress. That means that that element is in tension. Okay. Okay. All right. Any questions on uh, any questions on these? Yeah. Yeah. So they're they're assumed to be uniform throughout the entire bar. This wouldn't be the equivalent stress. No, yeah, this is this is kind of a much simpler, a much simpler stress. Mostly just because of the assumptions that we're placed, um, that we're placing on, you know, the deformations that are occurring. Yeah. Would there be a way to calculate You would you would have to we would have to lift a lot of our assumptions, and so you know we'd have to lift the assumption of uh, um, you know we'd have to assume that you know deformations can happen in, in different directions as well. Yeah. Uh, you can you can use this as as kind of the equivalent stress, and so if you kind of are saying, you know, if you have a situation where most of your if, where most of your stresses are going to be tensile compressive anyway, then you can use this as as failure criteria if if, if you want. Um, but if there's going to be any kind of shearing or any kind of out of plane um, stress as well. Um, then you would have to include those um, two, but but actually a lot of structures can be adequately modeled with, with trusses. You know, I think probably probably you've seen some before in your statics classes. 
And so for all of those situations, you know, you can use this and compare it to the yield strength to see if they would fail. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right, question. So can I go over how I got the minus C minus S C S again? Yeah. So that was that was kind of from the very beginning. And so um, basically the way the way that we obtained that, uh, I think it was from on the next page. Yep. So the way we obtained that was uh, we took this, um, you know, this made this vector of one minus ones and zeros, you know, which we obtained from you know the last row of our element stiffness matrix, and then I just multiply that by the transformation matrix in order to get this into the stationary coordinates. Yeah. And so I, I didn't actually perform this this uh, this this multiplication here, but basically if you take this row here and you multiply it by the transformation matrix. Um, which the expression for that, you know, we had in the previous on the previous set of lecture notes, and that's how we obtain these the sets of sines and cosines. Yeah. yeah. But but just like but just like Charlie said earlier, you know, um, you know, we you guys can just use this equation right here. And so the only thing you have to do is just plug in the appropriate values for the sines and cosines, and the appropriate values for the deformations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. And so that's uh, and so that's trusses. Should just skip to the end. Okay. All right, so I'd, I'd say you know trusses trusses kind of make up the the kind of the, the big meat of this of this section, um, and so I think these these problems are, are definitely you know the most the most challenging, and so the last uh, and so the last element type that we're going to go over in this direct stiffness method is beam uh, beam equations. All right. Um, so in, in truth, in truth, there's actually more beyond beams, but uh, but anything more beyond beams is just is just cruel and unusual, even even to myself. And so, um, and so you know what you'll see for beams. And so the, the big difference between beams and trusses is that you know up to this point we've assumed that all the deformations are always within you know in line with the element. Okay. Beams with beams, we're gonna, we're going to consider basically all other modes of deformation. Okay, at least all that we can feasibly consider in two D. Okay, and so in beams, you know what we're going to consider instead is that instead of a um, axial deformation, we're going to consider both transverse deformations. And rotation. And so on each node, if we call this node one, we'll call this node two, okay? Transverse deformation is just any deformation that's perpendicular to the element, okay? Okay, and so this is gonna be U1 Y hat, U2 Y hat, okay? And so now we're going to assume that we have deformations only in those directions, okay? In addition to that, we're also going to consider rotations, okay? And so what I mean by that is, you know, basically a change in the orientation of the beam at nodes one and two, okay? And so on the one side, we're going to have a rotation one, which we'll call the theta one. And then on the two side, we're going to have a rotation called theta two, okay? And so this is, and so this is going to be, you know, similar to our two D trusses in the fact that, you know, each of our nodes here are going to have two degrees of freedom. Okay. And so what this means is that our element stiffness matrix for a beam is going to be at the very least four by four. Okay. At least in the 1D case. Okay. Um, but because, you know, but because these deformation modes are so different. Um, from the trusses and the springs, 
this, this means that we're going to have to derive a whole new element stiffness matrix for a beam. Okay? And so the element stiffness for a beam will look almost nothing like the trusses and the springs that we've seen. And so, you know, the beam element stiffness matrix, you know, if you're, you know, I, I don't think I'm going to derive it. I think, you know, starting next class, I'm just, we're just, I'm just going to give it to you and just, we're going to roll with it. Okay. Um, but if you're curious, then the beam element stiffness matrix is based on Euler Bernoulli beam theory. Okay. All right. And some other, and some other good news for you is that, you know, because beams are just naturally kind of a, a little bit more complicated. We're going to restrict our beam problems to just uh, to just one D problems. Okay. And so that and so our element stiffness matrices are never going to get bigger than four by four. And so if we did 2D beam problems, then our element stiffness matrices would be six by six, okay? Uh, which is, you know, quite, quite, quite a doozy, okay? Right, and that, and that, that was kind of the evolution of this as well. And so the, and so, you know, just because we're out of time, you know, the, the evolution of beam equations is that the, the next, the next element type is called frames. And so for frame elements, you know, we make no assumptions on the deformations. And so frames can have transverse deformation, you can have axial deformation, it can have rotation, okay? And so by default, frame equations were, um, had element stiffness matrices of six by six. Um, and then if you did 2D frames, then you had six by six element stiffness matrices for so many different elements going around. And it was just, it was, it was, it was cruel. I'll, I'll, say, I'll say that. <laughs> And so I stopped doing that. And so, you know, I, I'm, I'm just limited to just beams for, for this one. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're welcome. It's, a, it's, it's, a, I'm, it's, it's good for myself too. So I don't have to write more frame problems because that's, that's not fun either. All right, any final questions before we wrap it up for today? Okay, all right. And so that's it for today. And so Thursday, we'll pick it up. We'll, uh, we'll jump right into beams. And so I'll give you the element stiffness matrix for a beam, and then we'll just start doing problems, right? And so hope you, so hope everyone has a good day. Um, you know, if you have questions on the project, I'll stick around after class and, and you know answer as many as I can. Um, you know, but if you if you have more questions later, feel free to email me. Um, you know, reach out to me, and I'm I'm happy to help. Right. So have a great evening, everyone, and I'll see you guys on on Thursday. Thank you, Professor. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Dr. Tran. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, yeah. Let me. Uh, so someone else asked first. Let me help him, and then I'll, I'll come to you after. Alan, I am your father.
So what's 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 in the folder? So was it able to delete some of the files? Or yeah. The only thing that's just 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 the only yeah, sometimes I think that I'm just having such a yeah. yeah, so and then so what uh, another thing that I try to do, I try to download it. So I download it like this in our installer. Yeah. So I can install it, but it only uninstalls the new one. Um, so we won't do that. Right. Okay, okay, so can you give me the download the new answers? Can you run the new answers? It'll, it'll run. Okay. But, like I said, it shows it's chocolate. Okay. okay. Yeah. yeah. And then when I try to look at the copies, it says that it's not found in the original file location. It's right here. I got it. Okay. I see. I understand. I know it's like super hot. I've been trying to I think, I, I think, I, I think I'll get it. I think because because this exists, I think there's some there's some system paths within your sure. machine that thinks Genesis is here, mm -hmm. which is why when you try to modify it, it goes to it goes there instead of there. Um, and so I, I think the key to this is, is trying to break those system paths. I don't know enough about Genesis to really know. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Let's. <laughs> so have you tried going in here and deleting kind of individual folders? Yeah. So the one first the one will do. What happened when you put the Oh, just, just yeah, so I click delete and it's just too easy. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, and even if I click like the whole file, it's just, okay. yeah. it, it just it won't go away. You know, it's funny because originally it would do like a loading screen saying yeah, yeah. Like deleting, uh -huh. and nothing was open to recycle and down, and then it will just take it. I see. What about some of the, because I saw some other folders that were like two folders. <laughs> Here, there's like it's all single. Like this stuff, I'm pretty sure. That's right. It's just that one down there. I know it's all just so yeah. So I already deleted everything that I could. Okay. So what I think I did is that when I was deleting the files initially, because that had it, that had it set to like a, like a specific Kansas folder. Yeah. And so it was just like a bunch of files. Just like, so it was like I kind of just like deleted the whole thing, and I guess it deleted everything that I was able to delete. Yeah. And then all this stuff stood. I see. Yeah. Let's try this. Let's try. Let's try renaming. Let's just try renaming this folder. We call it whatever. As long as it's not. Um, so let's first let's try moving this to the recycle box. I didn't I didn't think it would work, but it's worth it's worth a try. <laughs> and so oh, now this, that that's the error. I was getting to. That's a screenshot. I'm. I don't know what any of these is. Yeah, there is a lot of stuff. So I just screenshot it. Because this happened like on. Uh, I'm trying to like, fix this for a little while. Yeah. But then I was like, I know you were um, really at like a wedding. Yeah, it was possibly fixed. I was like, I feel like it was way too much to explain. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so this top this this is a Windows thing. It's uh yeah. So and what I was thinking was I could like and here's my and here's an issue. See like it would be like typically it'd be kind of easy to deal with this because obviously I have one drive. I can just load up all the files that I have into one drive and then just set the computer like new. The thing is I'm doing research with Professor Sue and I have this um, have this program in front of your mesh that it's like we have to pay for it and I only have we only have it like the two like I have a license and my teammate has a license so I don't know. I need to talk to like uh, so like my next step like I was talking to you is like I'm probably gonna talk to the IT that, like the IT department and ask them like what's the research should be doing there if I do the reinstall it or would go that route. This this might be a question for them because they because like because like I I if this were my computer I I would try I would, I would try some suspicious stuff and try to get rid of it. Yeah, I, I don't I don't want to I don't want to suggest those to you and then like script your computer. I've downloaded I've downloaded third party deleters uh, and it's still nothing. It's it's so weird and then so yeah. the same thing happens with um so for so the same thing happened with Solver. So it's like something with Solver and every other program like it did bring all the files up into my desktop. Uh -huh. Thing is, it's like like I said, when I tried moving from my desktop, it was like a year. So I just like started. So I was like, you know, delete Solver and do this. Uh -huh. And now I just have SolidWorks showing up in my apps, but then I can't like reinstall it. I can't use the uninstaller to get rid of it. That's so annoying. Yeah. So <laughs> I don't. Uh, yeah. So it's like 
I can never use one drive. I don't know why. <laughs> one drive is I hate one. I don't know why it just like clocks everything on my desktop, and then I like I like having everything up to date. So I was like, my OCD was like, I need to get rid of this. Uh -huh. So and then through doing that, I kind of like messed up my computer. So. I see. Yeah, this this might be a question because they because they would know because um, this because this this is more like Windows stuff. That I'm so one thing one thing I, I another thing I would try with the renaming. Is to see if you can you can change the properties of the ants that we reinstall oh, because now that now names. now the name has changed that 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 it might be a naive thing I don't I don't think it would work but it might it, it would be at least something I would try really quickly I mean go ahead and try it but I mean I don't I don't have it obviously okay okay yeah go ahead and try reinstalling it and see and see if that see if that helps then maybe when it reinstalls it doesn't see this anymore it doesn't see the name yeah and so it might just default to whatever. Yeah. I would hope. Yeah. Uh, how how big is this folder? It's it's, it's really not that big. Like I uh, it's really yeah. tiny. Yeah. It's just it's just it's file it's which will Okay. Yeah. And so in terms of space, it's 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 not taking up that much, but it's just the OCD of having it there and, you know, and just the mysteriousness of not being able to read something on your own computer. And then yeah, and then also the fact that it's kind of Keep me from being able to use like Kansas property. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, I would, I would try. Yeah, I would try reinstalling it and see see if that helps. See if you can modify the properties that just there. Um, in the short term, you know, I, I I try to keep the lab open every day, uh -huh. and so you can come here. You're welcome to come here. And okay. Work. Yeah, I can just um, upload because it's like oh, I can't even open it. <laughs> it shows up like this, and when I try to click on it, it's just it's open. Oh, I see. Um, um, like, um, so I mean, you're you're welcome to work here. So I, I try to keep the lab open, and if it's not open, you can just send me that. So I'm not here basically all day. Okay. So I can always open the door for you. Okay. And honestly, these these this version of Antis is going to be better the student one than we have because this is this is the academic license. Okay. And so you're going to be able to do more than just one click. Um, and so that's that's kind of a short term solution. Okay. And then let me know let me know what IT says about deleting these things. And, uh, um, you, you basically tried everything that I would try. <laughs> if this were, if this yeah. were my yeah, I've just not installed it. <laughs> I've, I'm telling you, like, I because it's like it happened to me, yeah, like, this, this, like, pretty much like before like the weekend started. Uh -huh. Then I was like dealing with like family stuff, so I just kind of, you know, I was like, you know, I'll do this later. And then sure enough, like yesterday, I was trying to like, trying to redo it. And I was there all day trying to do so, trying out the methods, trying to delete things. I've gone so deep. I didn't even know. I've gone so deep into this file. Like, I didn't even know it's possible. Like how far? Like I even like looked at like the, like the hidden items that were in there. Like, trying to like, try not to like break my computer in the process. Yeah. Yeah. To no avail. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you've tried everything that I would try to. So yeah. Let me uh, try reinstalling. Let me know what IT says. And okay. Then, Hopefully we can, we can find a solution. Do, do I have to call? I never contact IT. You can you can send them an email. Um, I think they have like a help desk company. So I think if you search up like Titan Store IT help desk, mm -hmm. then, then they, they have a contact. Do you know if they have like seniors? They should. So I've 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 been there once before, um, but they might tell you to go to go submit a ticket on Mars, and then they might call you after. So you can, I, they're probably closed right now. Mm -hmm. And so if you want to go maybe first thing tomorrow, go to like the technology section of the yeah. store. Okay. And then just say that yes. if you're having an issue with your windows, then uh -huh. you can submit like a nice new help ticket. Mm -hmm. you know, if they're not busy, maybe they help you out right there. Mm -hmm. But if not, they'll, they'll probably tell you to submit a ticket. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
I'm getting better actually. So I used to be I used to be not very good, but I'm teaching um, Bible techniques in those places for worship. Right? And there's a lot of free Bible activities to do this. So just just being just through being forced to like for kind of this. So I got to get good at it. Yeah, so now now I'm better. So now I can now now I can do this. Yeah. Okay, okay, sure. Um, I will say though that if, if other people are there, um, so I'm always happy to answer those questions, but then yeah, actually, they, 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 they take care of that. So, um, but if other people aren't there, then let me know. I missed it. Thanks, you too. Yeah, So two of the scenarios you have to So those are going to be your are constraints or constraints will probably say the same. Or which which one are you? Well, I just looked at it and looked at the same thing. Okay, okay. Yeah, so the inner line might have a whole scenario. Sir, you're the same. You're pretty good. Kind of scenario. So we're just trying to like free up some space for me. Trying to fix one of our programs and cooperation, like connect my one drive, and then I think we're doing that. We instead of some a lot of had files that were blocking it for like what like software files. Now we're looking like also get second like document section, and for your third one, I'm popping out on it. Like you don't have to come up with different documentation for that, but you can take one of their first two loading scenarios and just change the name. And so if you Use like you know, like, um, you know, I I wouldn't say I probably wouldn't use structural tool for a term of the like structural tool for this one. And so even for your first two scenarios, I'd be looking at these like what's the structural term. And then for your third scenario, I'd take to another like, yeah, so that actually like up the material three yes. and find like where all the material components are this so the so uh, scenario could be about the material as well. Yep. So mm -hmm. the material would be your third. Yeah. Yeah. So that'll be your third. That'll be your third. Scenario. But, oh. but for your first two, I want I want at least two different loading. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just think. Do you have any questions? I got your email today. I just didn't. I didn't get a chance to read it. So oh, I'll read that. I'll read that later tomorrow, and then I'll publish it. But it's a it's a it's a meeting for like type real right? Um, more like a design. Okay. Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to go. Um, I'd have to check my schedule, but but I yeah, definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you have a couple questions on the topic? Oh yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so I think the main question I have is just are the boundary settings that I put for this part, I guess, realistic. Okay. So what do you uh, what do you have right now? Um, right now. One configuration where it's basically a wall bracket. Right? Okay. It's going to support two, I guess, wooden panels. Mm -hmm. And I, I put it as 2,000 pounds of force just okay. guess, to assume that. But sure. would that be kind of guess, too much in this situation? Uh, is, it, is it breaking? Not that I put it under. I, I have, um, so I'm trying composites to make this. Uh -huh. And it didn't break. Okay, then it's, uh, it's not too much, then it's, it's fine. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, it's, I know you said that in our report we kind of have to justify it. Yeah. Uh -huh. Do you want, I guess, like an estimation of where that that force? Or? Yeah, so uh, uh, so just think of an object that's 2,000 pounds that would be supported by this, by this bracket. And so that's, I think it's fine. I mean, that's, I mean, that's reasonable. I mean, it's, it's not like a, a bajillion tons. <laughs> it's 2,000, yeah. I can think of a lot of 2,000 pound objects and stuff. You know, would have that be supported by bracket? I think it's, it's fine. So, you know, just you know, just come up with the story. So, what's a common two thousand pound object that you think would be supported <laughs> by wall bracket? Yeah, that makes I think sense. anything you come up with is is, is fine. Right, sure. mm -hmm. I guess the second question would be just going with the clarifications for the project is that we need to have two configurations where it's a different material. 
Um, so two different two different situations where the loading is different. Um, so probably probably between all your situations, the constraints are going to be the same because you're going to fix it in the same place. But I want two different um, two different configurations for the loading. So right now you have one we're supporting a, a two thousand pound weight. Um, maybe for another situation. So and so I, I was just telling him too that usually for your two situations, situation one could be like a typical use case. So you know just like a normal operation. And so I think that's pretty reasonable to support weight. Um, situation two could be like um, like an, un, an, un, an unexpected type of loading. So um, for the wall bracket support, because the wall bracket all the time is just support stuff. And so I would say for the wall bracket, maybe you add some additional force to it. Maybe there's something that's sitting on top of it that's that's adding some additional additional weight. Um, in addition to that, you can change the direction of the force. And so maybe this wall bracket is loaded a different way. Uh, or you can you can you can fix it on the other side, and so that, I think that might be interesting too. You fix you fix the wall bracket on the side where you didn't do it on the previous one, and then you load it in a different direction on the other. On the other. All of those all of those would be fine for situ for loading situation number two. For the third situation overall, you can you can just change the material for the other So you you have you have three at least three situations overall. And so loading scenario one, loading scenario two. And then material energy. Okay. Yeah, I think I was a little bit confused because for the second configuration, it's actually really a lot different. Mm -hmm. it's, about the, it's, it's still the same in a sense where there's two fixed boards here, mm -hmm. but instead, this is the same. So it's two wall and this is supporting the shelf. Oh, Which perfect. Works. Yeah, perfect. That's kind of like yeah, yeah, that's perfect. Oh, okay. I love it. Yeah. I thought that was, I guess, not, I thought I was interpreting the directions right, but I can't. Just the yeah, yeah, no, that's that's perfect. Yeah, it's it's basically the the idea. I mean, the the minimum thing I, I want I wanted you guys to do is to at least change the direction of the force, because these none of these parts and the bearing housing a little bit. None of them are particularly symmetric, and so if you change the direction of the force, that's going to change how the stress is distributed over the material. And so I wanted you guys to be able to see that by doing at least two different loading scenarios. And so, um, and so yeah, you're going to get that exactly what the force do. So that's perfect. All right, cool. Uh, I think that's, that's a normal question. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Christopher, are you still are you still there? Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, I just got back. Right, yeah, no worries. Sure. Ah, oh, I'm 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 gonna give you guys freedom to choose, you know, whatever you want the material. So I mean, I would say at least one of your material should be should be reasonable, um, but the other material, you know, you can even just do something for fun. So you can make it out of plastic or something and see what happens. So, um, you know, have 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 some fun with it too. I mean, at least at least one should be, um, you know, at least one at least one should be realistic. But the other one, I think, is is fine if you want to have fun with it. You know, as long as long as the material actually exists in the world and it's not yeah. vibranium or something like right. that, then that's that's fine with me. Of course. Okay, cool. All righty. Well, thank you for that, Dr. Tran. Yep. See you next time then. Yep. See you next time.